Hey everyone, welcome back to Policy Punchline. Here at the show, we interview scholars, policymakers, public intellectuals about some of the most urgent issues and frontier ideas in our world today. I'm Princeton senior Tiger Gao. Uh, today, we continue our aspiring intellectuals special coverage where we interview some of the world's most famous scientists, scholars, intellectuals uh, about more foundational concepts uh, in our world today. And I'm very honored to be joined uh, by George Church, who is Robert Winthrop Professor of Gen Genetics uh, at Harvard Medical School and Professor of Health Sciences and Technology at Harvard and MIT. He is known as the father of synthetic biology and the CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing technology, and he is widely recognized as one of the most important geneticists of our age. Uh, in 1984, he developed the first direct genomic sequencing method, which resulted in the first genome sequence. He helped initiate the Human Genome Project in 1984 and the Personal Genome Project in 2005. Uh, he now leads his own lab in Harvard and is also affiliated with the Broad Institute, uh, the Viss Institute, and a wide number of private companies that were spun off from his innovations. Uh, Professor Church is also director of the U.S. Department of Energy Technology Center and director of the National Institutes of Health Center of Excellence uh, in Genomic Science. And this is just a very abbreviated introduction and, and bio for Professor Church uh, because he has done uh, so many fascinating works. So Professor Church, thank you so much for joining me today. It's truly an honor. Thank you. Uh, great to be here. Yeah. So perhaps we can uh, first talk a little bit more about your early career, uh, maybe back when you were in your 20s or even younger, uh, how you stumbled upon uh, the, the field of biology, chemistry, uh, maths, and sciences. Uh, you, you talked about how you attended Andover for high school with, and then Duke for undergrad and Harvard for graduate school. So at first sight, it seems that you went through a very prestigious pipeline of elite uh, educations, but in fact, you also had many uh, struggles. So, so would, would you mind telling us a little bit more about your early journey? Well, I guess my first struggle, I mean, all of these are first world problems. Not, not <laughs> yes. To complain about. Uh, but uh, my first was, you know, I was uh, born in a place with very poor uh, science education, and I didn't know any scientists or engineers uh, in Florida. Although once I did get to Andover for high school, it was like a whole opening up, and that contrast was enough that really highly motivated me. So, so maybe it was better that I was deprived and then, um, and then moved on. I had to repeat ninth grade. Uh, that's how bad my, even though I was at the top of my class in Florida, I it was at the bottom of my class, it, even after being set back a grade, uh, and it took me, uh, you know, a few months to catch up. Uh, but then, but again, I, it kind of encouraged me to try a little harder because I sort of felt like I was on probation or something, uh, and I really, I didn't feel like that was me. I didn't feel that was my identity. So that was the beginning. That was the first uh, little setback. Um, uh, then I. I I decided for some reason or other after four years at Andover, I wanted to be a slightly warmer place for college, which I think is a very poor reason to pick a college. Uh, so I went to Duke, I, you know, finished Duke in two years, which, uh, which I think was also unwise, um, but it was like financially motivated, but not, not, not very good logic nevertheless. And then I proceeded <laughs> to flunk out of Duke. So another uh, couple years uh, set back. Um, but then I got into Harvard by some miracle, uh, <laughs> despite having flunked out of graduate school and uh, worked with Wally Gilbert, which was obviously a very good experience. Uh, at, at Duke, though, I did, I did uh, get some, uh, to answer your question about how I got interested in biology, I uh, was interested in almost all sciences. I was particularly interested in, in, in biology, both because of the natural environment I was in, such as the mud flats and canals of Florida, and, and my third father was a physician. So those two very different angles on biology got me excited. But I was interested in c computers and math and physics and so on. So when I, at Duke, I was looking for a way that I could put them all together and do real research uh, right away. And, uh, and that happened my, my, my sophomore year, which was also my last year, where I got into Sung Ho Kim's lab and found crystallography and it was like, it was really like finding a religion almost. It was very, uh, quite an experience because you really needed to have all, all the sciences and math and computers to, to just keep your head above water. And I love that. 
So, so crystallography then led me, to, it was the only field really in, in, in um, biology and chemistry that w had decent amount of automation and computers and biophysical theory. So I uh, then applied that to almost every other field of, of biology slowly one by one as I did my, as I restarted my graduate career. It, did you really enjoy research when you were undergrad? You knew that you wanted to be a researcher? Oh, uh, I, I loved research from, even in high school, I managed to get, uh, do independent research, both in biology and chemistry, um, where they gave me the, the keys to the chemistry lab, which I thought was pretty pretty radical thing to do during the 60s and 70s, or, or late 60s, early 70s. And uh, yeah, I did both synthesis and analysis in chemistry. Uh, and then, yeah, and as soon as I hit college, I started doing um, independent research in computer science and in mycoplasma patho pathogens, and then finally crystallography. Or, so, so you did mention that your first job was studying x-ray crystallography uh, of macromolecules, which uh, sounds like a very uh, foreign term to, to me, I, but, but you did mention that it's very interdisciplinary. It would require all kinds of understanding. So, uh, was that the experience that instilled this sense of interdisciplinarity in, in you such that in later parts of your research, you still very uh, care a lot about this connectivity between different disciplines? Yeah, I, I, I never did want to specialize. Uh, and as, as a youth, that makes some sense. You, you know, you're not supposed to, you're supposed to get a liberal arts education uh, in college. That's a, that's a common theme in America. Um, but I really did. I really wanted to do to do to have something where I could justify all uh, continuing to do all of the sciences, and uh, and crystallography did that for me. And I felt that there must be, if there if there weren't other things like that, I could make that happen. So it, it wasn't so much that it instilled it in me; it it allowed it to uh, propagate and continue survive that that feeling of of uh, connectedness. So perhaps we can maybe talk a little bit more about the time between you flunk out of graduate school and the time uh, when you started uh, the Human Genome Project, which is, I, I know it's a decent period of time because uh, you also spoke about how Harvard took a chance on you three times as when you left Duke, uh, when you left your postdoc, uh, and when you lost your major source of funding, when being evaluated for tenure and, and Harvard yeah. was there. Um, and, and, and initially your research uh, for Human Genome Project which the, the human sequencing research that you were doing for it, it wasn't so popular back then and eventually it evolved into the human genome project so would you mind telling us a little bit more about that part of your journey yeah i mean we could frame it in terms of harvard saving me three times i mean it's it's maybe uh i mean some of the other institutions i've been at did, did not feel that way so uh, <laughs> yes, yes you know basically at duke and at uh HHMI, I sort of felt like it's one strike and you're out. You didn't even get three strikes. And, and Harvard just, just continually gives me breaks. Uh, I'm not quite sure why, but uh, it's wonderful. I think, they, I think they feel secure enough in their position in time, the, in space, that they, they can take uh, that, 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 that. It's not even a risk for them. Anyway, the first time um, was... Uh, well, they let, maybe it was four times, because at first they let me in in the first place uh, with only one year of college under my belt. Uh, I applied at the end of my freshman year, and, uh, and they didn't seem to blink about it. Uh, and then I said no, which was really <laughs> stupid, another stupid thing I did, because uh, I, I felt that I had some momentum in, in crystallography, which I did. Uh, and I did eventually, and, and so then, so then uh, I flunked down. I worked as a technician for a year, and my advisor, Sung Ho, said, you know, you're not a very good technician. Uh, <laughs> you're probably going to, you probably should consider going back to school. And, yeah. uh, you know, because I wasn't very obedient. I mean, I was very <laughs> polite and diplomatic, but I would just, I just had uh, these, all these visions, you know. And uh, so Sung Ho liked me, and he wanted me to so I applied to graduate school. So then I did another stupid thing, which is I only applied to one graduate school. And it, and it wasn't like a safety net graduate school. It was Harvard uh, Molecular Biology, which was like their top department. And, 
Um, anyway, I got in the second time, and, and the only way I can explain that miracle, I mean, I've tried to a few times, you know, people ask me, and I say, well, I think number one was they had accepted me once before, and they figured, well, he can't be that different, really, even though he flunked out of his way. <laughs> they, they never explained it. I never asked, but yeah. in my <laughs> rationalizations. Uh, secondly, uh, I had published five papers um, at Duke, um, which, were, which were pretty good in, in, in crystallography. Um, and one of, the, one of the computer methods that I, I, I developed uh, would, would persist for 30 years. Uh, and one of the papers was later taught in one of my classes uh, that I didn't realize it was going to be taught. Uh, I'm just sitting in the auditorium, and there it is up on the screen. Um, so that was the second thing. Uh, oh, the third thing is they were hungry for uh, crystallographers. I mean, uh, Strominger and Wiley and Harrison and Gilbert and Potashny, they all wanted crystallographers. Uh, and there's no way you can get a crystallographer out of undergrad. I mean, back then, undergraduates hardly did any research, much less in crystallography, which is a, which is a very long play uh, game. I mean, crystallography, you know, it's a decade. It's, it's, it's many person years to do a crystal structure back then. And, uh, but anyway, I, was, I had it. I mean, I had done, I had published in crystallography, uh, and uh, including a nucleic acid, which was, ours was the first uh, folded nucleic acid. So they, that's what they wanted. Uh, I don't know whether that came into it, but that was uh, another possibility. And there may, there may have been other reasons, but those were, I think, the reasons that I got uh, accepted the second time. Um, did, did you notice that the landscape has changed a little bit uh, for, for kids these days? For example, do you get emails from undergrad, high school students these days saying, Professor Church, I, I'm from here and here, and I've been doing research. I want to work for you as a, as a freshman in college. Uh, <laughs> It's more common, yes, it's more common uh, that, uh, of course, I'm seeing a bias view, there's ascertainment bias here, but, but yes, it, it seems like more undergraduates are doing research, and many of them are doing research from the freshman year the way I did, um, but it was, it was pretty uncommon back then. Um, uh, and, and also, undergraduates are taking a year or two off in between uh, undergraduate and graduate school to augment their CV with, with publications. Um, I, I was not doing that. I mean, I, I didn't want to take a year. In fact, I wanted to accelerate by two years, yes. but it ended up, <laughs> it looks like I took a year off. Uh, yeah. um, but anyway, so that was the first time Harvard saved me. And the second time was I'm, uh, I go to do my postdoc in San Francisco from, from, from Boston. And uh, oh, and by the way, another mistake is I gave up a Harvard Junior Fellowship, which is a very prestigious fellowship, in order to go to a, a you know regular um, postdoc in San Francisco. And my uh, uh, girlfriend uh, went went at the same time, and we were one was at UCSF and one was at Stanford, which is not ideal. They're not as close as you might think. Uh, by yes. Year. <laughs> and uh, yeah. and then after. Four or five months, she decided that that her postdoc wasn't very good, and she went back to the East Coast. And at that point, I'm like, you know, I've got a three-year fellowship, uh, LSR fellowship, and I figure I, I should wrap it. You know, I'd like to wrap it up to to go back to the East Coast with her. But this is this is a daunting task to interrupt. You know, I I, I, I followed her to the West Coast, and I was going to follow her back to the East Coast. And I did, I wrapped it up as quickly as I could, and, uh, but I had no pu publications for my postdoc, other than sort of wrap-up publications that were at the end of my PhD, that were directly relevant to my PhD, but nothing, nothing on embryonic stem cells, which is what I was working on in Gail Martin's lab as a postdoc for, at this point, a few months. Um, but uh, Harvard not only accepted me with no, no postdoc publications, but helped, get, helped me get a HHMI uh, um, investigator award, which meant that, that most of my lab was paid for into the indefinite future, um, so I didn't have to write grants. Uh, nevertheless, I was encouraged to write a DOE grant because the DOE was launching the Genome Project. This is before NIH even got involved, so I did, a, I did do a grant anyway, and that was nice, and I've had that DOE grant ever, ever since, so from 18, 1987 till present, and we still have it. Um, and, and also, by the way, my girlfriend, I've now been together with her for 
41 years, and we have two granddaughters. So that was worth following her <laughs> yes, yes. back and forth. <laughs> uh, um, so then the third time was uh, that lovely HHMI funding started getting sour. They didn't like the fact that I was uh, using computers. So every year they would redline through my budget any, th any computer. They would say, no, you're not, no, no. They would give me as many disk drives as I wanted, but I didn't, but no computer to use them on, which I thought was mildly amusing. Um, fortunately, I did have another grant, this DOE grant, and I would buy the computer on the DOE grant and the disk drives on the HHMI. And they also didn't like the fact that I was involved in multiple startup companies, um, which I felt was a necessity for getting, actually getting our, our technologies out into the world so, there, so we could share it with everybody. I felt that I needed to um, accompany them and get, get the work done. And uh, um, so, uh, for one reason or another, we, we're st still not quite clear. Um, I did not get my, I, after 11 years of HHMI funding, which is a good, good run, I was asked to leave. But the timing was bad because I was up for tenure, and one of the main criteria for tenure is that you're self-sufficient. And here I did, I lost, you know, 60%, 70% of, uh, of my funding. And uh, nevertheless, Harvard uh, did its, you know, uh, tried, and I also didn't have that many publications uh, either. I mean, I, I had a really great start at graduate school. I had five publications before I started graduate school, but by the time <laughs> I got to, uh, yeah. to tenure, I didn't have many more. Uh, <laughs> and, but nevertheless, they gave me, they gave me tenure, and, and they even got me $2.5 million of a philanthropic uh, gift, a, a lovely gift from uh, Evelyn Lipper. Uh, and her foundation, so uh, who, with whom I still interact uh, now, uh, you know, over two decades later. Um, anyway, those are some of the nice things that Harvard has done for me, and uh, and MIT has also been a kind of a co-conspirator as well. I've been I've been there even longer. I've been at Harvard. At seventy three, I did a, a course in quantum mechanics, uh, uh, and uh, and then ever since then I've have had. Uh, appointment in both, ever, sorry, ever since 87-ish, I've had an appointment in both universities and, you know, roughly half of students come, uh, PhD candidates come from each school. So. Uh, Professor Church, I feel like you're really downplaying the, uh, your, your early geniusness. <laughs> In your well, early career, you you were, you were saying I I, yeah, I I I couldn't get enough publications. I was and then and then but but uh, something always worked out. But you must have been really really good. I mean, especially how you saw human sequencing and then founding the the, the human genome project. Could you tell us a little bit uh, about how that uh, came together? Um. Yeah. I, uh, hmm. Um. So. As a crystallographer, we did the first folded nucleic acid, and we wanted to know how general that structure was. You know, it was a three-dimensional structure, um, and it was derived from a one-dimensional structure, 76 A, C's, G's, and U's, with that 76 mer folded up into a nice little transfer RNA. And uh, so it turned out that back then, it, uh, it not only w uh, it was one of the most popular nucleic acids to sequence. So of all the DNAs and RNAs in the world, that's what everybody was determining the linear sequence, the, the order of those 76. And so, so there were 100 plus of those, uh, and I typed them all in. So I essentially typed in almost all of the DNA, RNA sequence in the world uh, at that time. And it didn't take that long. It, it would take, it would be impossible to do today to type it all in. Uh, most of them are entered automatically. And they're, uh, you know, trillions of base pairs. But back then, you could type it in in a day. And then I folded them up in the computer to, to see if they could fold up the same as the one we did. And they, they all could. And I said, wow, this is, this is really easy. Sequencing is easier than crystallography. And you can use the two together and you can fold up everything. So I said, well, let's just, why don't we just sequence all the people and all the organisms 
and then fold up all their DNA and RNA and proteins. And I think it was very naive uh, notion uh, because First of all, protein folding was much harder than RNA folding. Second of all, we, we had very few crystal structures at the time, which was key to, to the folding, um, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, but, you know, four decades later, I'm still folding up nucleic acids and proteins. And, uh, but I did double down on that idea of, of sequencing everybody and everything. And, and uh, and I thought that, well, uh, it slowly dawned on me we're going to have to bring down the price. I, I thought of it initially as just improving the technology, but eventually it became clear that you had to very radically reduce the price. And uh, by the time we, uh, so by the time I was uh, halfway through my thesis, I, I, at the beginning of my thesis, I did a little bit of dabbling on sequencing technology, but, but nobody really wanted to hear it. Uh, at one point, I wrote software, for example, for automated sequencing <clears throat> during one of my rotations. We would do four rotations in four different labs at the beginning because we we're supposedly testing out the labs. And I knew I wanted to work with Wally Gober, but I still went, did the four rotations, and they all helped. Um, but one of them, I, I, I wrote software, this is like in 78, to analyze uh, sequences automatically. And to, 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 to go from the raw data on films to... Uh, a, C's, G's, and T's on the, on the paper or the screen. And, uh, and I came back to my mentor, who was a six-year graduate student. I was a first-year graduate student, Greg Sutcliffe. And he said to me, what do you want to do that for? That's, that's the only part of sequencing that's fun, is sitting down with your coffee and, and reading the sequence. And I had to agree with him. You know, I had gone off and done this programming uh, without thinking it through. And... Uh, and it was probably eight years too early. Um, uh, eventually, it was, uh, it was important. Eventually, it became the bottleneck. Um, but, it, you know, it was too early. Uh, but then, that, the, that, then the second half, then there was a little hiatus where I did kind of genetics for a while uh, on yeast uh, RNA splicing. And then I came back to sequencing finished my thesis on a new sequencing method that led, to, um, led me to the first three meetings, each of which kind of independently, uh, or at least two of them independently, we thought of the Genome Project collectively. It was you know, like uh, 10, maybe 12 of us at each, at each of the first two meetings. And you know, we just said, uh, let's, you know, we, we think we can do a genome, and we just pulled out of the air a dollar a base. It was a rough estimate of how much it would cost in the lab. I think it was actually more expensive than that because most labs at the time were incompetent at it, and they would s spend six months floundering around before they get the first good sequence. But anyway, a, a buck a base, uh, which would mean $3 billion for a poor genome, uh, poor in the sense that it wasn't finished. It was only, each of us has two genomes, one from our mother, one from our father. And so it should be six billion, but it was really only going to be three billion, kind of an average of the of multiple genomes. Anyway, uh, I was not happy with the three billion dollar price tag, nor yes. the <laughs> fact that it was not going to be a high quality clinical grade genome. Um, yeah. But I went along with it for what because I was the youngest member of each of these meetings. Um, and anyway, that's 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 the origin. Uh, two uh, immediate questions on my mind is. How did the three billion dollar price tag exactly come together? I mean, that, that sounds mind boggling. And also, uh, over the past forty years or so, you've essentially reduced the price by, I think, ten million fold. And now you can uh, do it with three hundred bucks. Uh, so, so that's what the first part. The second part is, uh, what is the exact significance uh, of this product? Would you mind contextualizing a little bit for our listeners? Because is it a good analogy to say you are essentially building? The internet, unlocking, uh, building some kind of an infrastructure or baseline to the foundation of all kinds of later uh, genetics innovations and genomics uh, innovations. Yeah, so the three billion, as I said, we pulled the dollar, the buck a base dollar uh, out of the air. It was a rough estimate for what we thought it was costing our lab to do a, f a small piece of DNA, like a thousand bases, might cost a thousand dollars. We felt that was kind of a reasonable estimate, but. Scaling 
you know, it's, but it, it's not true that, uh, you know, uh, not all tasks are easily scalable. And that was probably, we felt that might not be scalable, or might be anyway. We, we just multiplied it. So there's three billion base pairs in, in one genome, and we just kind of ignored the second genome that's present in everybody's cell and uh, said we'd do uh, kind of a reference genome. So that's where the three billion came from. And it turned out to be fairly accurate, partly because there's a tendency of self-fulfilling prophecies. If you tell a community that they've got $3 billion, they're not going to say, whoa, I could do it for 300000 you know. <laughs> they're going to they're gonna yeah. spend it, and they did. Uh, I, I was probably the only person that was complaining about the, 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 at the beginning. Yeah. Because uh, I think most people were saying, oh, $3 billion, that would be like a real nice. uh, gift to biology to get that input. Yeah. And, it, and it was. Uh, we went to the trouble, we, mainly Jim Watson and uh, some of the elder uh, biologists, went to Congress directly and got a line item for it at a time where the, fun the NIH funding had been kind of slipping. Uh, and uh, so they gave us this whole new line item for $3 billion over a 15-year period. Um, we finished early, but that was, there was a commitment there. And, um, uh, and then the NIH budget, for that reason and probably other reasons, doubled in the next few years. Uh, so that, uh, maybe they got ex finally got excited about science, or who knows what, what happened, but they doubled the budget, literally. Um, uh, and uh, I, mean, I think Harold, Var uh, Harold Varmus and uh, Bill Clinton uh, were part of that uh, story. Um, any, anyway, the, the genome, uh, the, we brought the price down. I mean, that, my plan for all big projects is first thing you do is bring down the price, and then you can do a bigger project. Yeah, I would, it seemed like uh, we could pull, maybe pull off a $3 billion genome, but uh, it, would be, it would be hard to get to do that again, and, and we really don't. Uh, the genomes are really only useful in their uh, comparisons, or that's their main utility, is you compare your genome with mine, you compare the human genome with the uh, uh, chimpanzee, human and chimpanzee, to all the other mammals, and then all the microbes. And you want genome comparison. You want a lot of genomes. Um, and that's where you learn it. And uh, which gets to your other question about the significance of this project, um, which is, and then I'll get to how we brought the price down. The significance is almost everything in biology at this point uh, has some DNA sequence connection. Um, if you're doing uh, ecology and conservation, then you're, you want to assess the diversity, the gen genetic diversity, which you do by sequencing. You want to identify new species based on sequencing. You want to do the, the tree of life by sequencing. You, uh, uh, and if you're going to do in, can, any kind of uh, de-extinction or, or uh, uh, reduction in uh, uh, risk of endangered species, that's all done in the context of the, the genes that you want to, to use. So all of edit, so there's a big thing about editing DNA and uh, gene therapy. All of that is based on sequencing. Um, diagnostics is increasingly both cancer, infectious disease, um, you, you, it's really hard to develop any new uh, biotechnology without sequencing in the background. So it's, uh, I think it, it's not, as much as sequencing is appreciated, it's not appreciated that almost every editing has sequencing right behind it, you know, right in, in the back room. So um, I've been involved in both both editing, next-gen editing and next-gen sequencing, uh, and, uh, and some of the first-gen as well, and uh, it's quite clear to me that we wouldn't be editing without sequencing. So that's the significance. How we brought the price down was, uh, I would say, multiplexing. A lot of people think that it was parallelism, where you, you fill a room with identical devices and they all do what a human would do, you know, which is like pipetting, except now pipetting with a machine. Um, but in practice, that doesn't actually really bring the price down. That just means you can do it faster, but not cheaper. Uh, you, you're actually spending more money 
uh, per unit time and the same amount of money per output, each base pairs of sequence. Um, so, but multiplexing, on the other hand, you'll, uh, it's a concept that started in telecommunications where you would send multiple uh, communications through the same channel. So in the same point in space and time, you'd have many conversations, either telegraph conversations or modern video on optical fibers. But it goes back to the 1800s with Edison. That's electrical and electronic uh, multiplexing. Molecular multiplexing is very analogous. You basically have a drop of liquid, and a drop of liquid is kind of what we work with all day, drops of clear liquid. Um, but in now, instead of doing one experiment in one droplet, you can do a billion. Uh, so you can have a billion barcoded molecules in there, and they're all doing the same thing, so that's, so that's efficient. Um, but it's not like you have to have a billion pipetting devices. Uh, you just need one, and you get it a billion times. So, that, so multiplexing has been one of the themes throughout my career. And it's not just for sequencing, it's for synthesis, for editing, for uh, cell biology, virology, neurobiology, all of those have a multiplex component to them. And again, this is something that happens like behind the scenes. People know even less about multiplexing than they know about sequencing. They're using it, but it's just like they take it so for granted. It's wonderful. I mean, it means, it means you arrived when the stuff that you worked on is, is so taken for granted you don't even notice it. Um, so, you know, it's like when you do, you know, Google Maps. You don't even think about, most people don't think about the, the technology of launching and maintaining the GPS satellites um, and, the, and the atomic clocks that, that those satellites use to get the precision they need. Right? Very few people worry about you know, whether the cesium clocks are working today uh, you know, for the GPS. Anyway, I, I, uh, I, I, multiplexing I guess... helped bring the price down, and it's now down 10 million maybe 30 million fold. Um, it'll probably be $100 per, per high quality. Now, these are high quality clinical grade genomes, meaning they're uh, both, your, both your parents uh, and at, at a uh, error rate that's uh, 10 to the minus seventh or so, one error in 10 million. I guess one good, a lot of people uh, use Moore's law to describe this, but I, I guess the, the analogy is, slightly inadequate because in some sense, Moore's law is about miniaturing. So at some point it's gonna plateau, but biology and, and the, the multiplexing as you described, this is vertical, this is exponential. So the, well, the, both, the kind of growth. Both, in all fairness, they are both exponential and they both are about miniaturization. It's just one of them in the uh, electronics, they have, they have to, it's not their fault, uh, but so far they have to um, lay out every piece. Now they don't do it, they don't do it with pick and place robots they do it with you know cameras and such for microfabrication but they have to uh, in uh, parallel synthesize it, it's somewhere in between parallel and multiplex um, and it uh, they both scale down to sort of the nanometer scale the biochemicals however will scale uh, to a precision of fractional nanometers while electronics is kind of stuck at, you know, single digit nanometers. Um, but the real problem is that in order to get a wafer with billions of circuit elements on it is a multi-billion dollar fabrication organization. Uh, but to make trillions, quadrillions, Quintillions of uh, biomolecules is basically free. I mean, it's 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 all due to self-assembly, and it can be a very messy system. I mean, just you know, look at how, just look at uh, you know, birth of an animal uh, is it's it's very it's amazing that uh, that you get kind of consistent results over and over without any uh, manager running the QC uh, system. So. Uh, so we're taking advantage of self-assembly. In a way, it was a gift. It, it, there's certain analogies between biology and engineering. Uh, the, the evolution is trial and error. A lot of engineering is trial and error. Uh, there are some analogies, but it's a gift. It was like we were given uh, things that look like engineered things, uh, all the way from the molecular level, all the way up to materials and, and 
you know, freeze and uh, uh, you name it. Uh, we have atomically precise technology that came from what's uh, from evolution, and we can and we're harvesting that. We're essentially going around the world sequencing, and when we sequence, we find things like CRISPR just sitting there in our DNA sequences, and we don't really it takes us a while to figure out what it does, but it's it's like a gift. Uh, it's like a you know a space uh, lander landed you know with, yeah. uh, in our backyard full of great stuff, <laughs> but just no instruction manuals. Yeah. Uh, I, I, so before we go to CRISPR, which you just brought up, perhaps we can also quickly touch on per, the personal genome project, which uh, you, you helped found in 2005, 21 years after the, the Human Genome Project. Uh, that also pioneered a new form of genomics research because the main goal of the project as described is to allow scientists to connect human genetic information from DNA sequence to gene expression with human trait information, like medical information, uh, physical traits, and also those environmental exposures. So it has tremendous value when it comes to uh, me medical uses. Uh, so would you mind telling us a little bit more uh, about the Personal Genome Project? Well, the Personal Genome Project was uh, intended to be a kind of a demonstration, uh, pro provocation, a very gentle, um, not too much in your face provocation, because at the time there was a lot of and there still is a lot of silos where people hoard their data. There's a lot of uh, miscommunication with, where people would, would uh, abuse their patients, where they, would, they wouldn't fully inform them. They would tell them stories that weren't true, like, oh, we can protect your data. We, you know, we can keep your pr data private. Even though at that same time, there were millions of medical records that were uh, had escaped or had been stolen. So it was a, so we wanted them at least to refine their language to be more forthright. Um, I mean, they tended to be honest, but they would by, you know, by legally couching everything uh, very carefully. And forthrightness is different from that. It's, it's making sure that people know uh, what the risks are. And then, and then there was also this barrier where uh, people who were advocates, you know, that had a disease in their family, and their complaint was not privacy, it was that they couldn't get their data shared among the, the scientists. Um, so it was a patient advocacy uh, thing as well. Uh, there's also a demonstration of how quickly you could get technology into uh, a clinical setting. Um, there, there was a number of things that was intended to, to demonstrate, or at least, yeah, demonstrate at once. Um, and uh, I was, um, so we, we re-examined the consenting mechanism um, and uh, a number of other, we questioned almost everything um, and uh, ended up with something that was surprisingly successful. It's now incorporated in uh, six different countries with very different uh, ethics boards, very different systems. Um, but they all approved it, uh, showing this a general uh, protocol whereby basically we recruit people who are okay with, generally enthusiastic about sharing their uh, medical records and, um, and DNA sequence. You really need both. I mean, for a while we were trying to uh, either um, share one and the other separately or encrypt them in various ways that de de debilitated the data, um, putting in intentional errors. Uh, that, that's actually come up multiple times as a solution. Uh, it's, a, it's sort of uh, antithetical to most science. And it was very ironic that, that one of the most open sciences in the history of science, which was the Genome Project, um, led to one of the most closed sciences, which was the, the um, personal, you know, the, the connection for each person of their uh, uh, genome and phenome, their traits. Uh, so, we, so we just showed that it could be done. Well, a lot of people said, oh, it can't be done. You won't get people to agree to that. You won't get, uh, you know, uh, you know, bad things will happen. People, it, it, people will see their own genome. That was another thing. They, they would uh, read your genome and then claim they, they couldn't do anything about it. 
they couldn't give it to you. They, 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 our hands are tied, you know. And, and if they even saw something that could save your life, they couldn't communicate it to you because A, you were supposed to be de-identified, and B, even if you weren't de-identified, um, you know, they, they didn't have permission to. And we just shared the data with you and figured um, that, that we would um, make sure at the beginning of the project that you had gone through a, a, an exam that showed that you knew what you were getting into and you weren't going to react, you at least understood that you shouldn't react uh, negatively until you had confirmed the diagnosis by, by conventional means. Anyway, it was radical, and, but it did make its point, and many of the studies around the world have taken steps in that direction. They still haven't gone all the way um, to full sharing, um, but they are much more forthright in their uh, agreements and in their consent forms. They, uh, they, they do give the data back to the individual, which was a radical concept at the beginning. Uh, there are a number of things that they've adopted that are I think, uh, um, much better now. Um, and the Personal Genome Project will continue to go. It's kind of like a ratchet. As more and more people decide to share, uh, you, you typically don't go backwards. You don't say, oh, yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's like at one point or another we decided to share our face, which is, I think, more revealing than your genome, at least right now. It tells you whether you're sick, whether you're happy or sad or angry, uh, it, bored asleep, all kinds of things are revealed by your face. But we decided at one point that we would share it, and pretty much no going back. I mean, there's a few very small uh, exceptions, um, um, you know, uh, yeah. masks, for example, in the yeah. days of COVID. <laughs> but but uh, for the most part, we, we prefer to share our faces at this point. And I think that may be true for... Uh, the need for privacy is a symptom, not so much a goal, it, it, or it can be thought of as a symptom rather than goal. What it means is there's some consequences of sharing information that could save your life. Um, there's some negative consequences. Yes. Uh, and so what we should do is fix those negative consequences rather than not share. I mean, I that's see. one way of looking at it. Uh, could, could we just uh, dive in a little bit more to the moral attention here a lot of people claim there's a moral attention here because if we look at what happened with the internet and all the tech innovations that silicon valley brought us silicon valley essentially helped bring down the the cost of using internet and using technology to, to almost zero but in some way in exchange because you're using google map for free you have to give them your data and they can uh, sort of do it and there are a lot of scholars who find that problematic because they say that surveillance capitalism the whole uh, business model in Silicon Valley is a lot of times based on using users' data and, and then giving you Facebook for free and, and so on. So, but I, I understand that uh, there is not this kind of monetary motivation here uh, to, to send users ads from, from like Facebook from, from a human genome project. But uh, do you see any uh, ethicists coming up to you and say, uh, yes, Professor Church, I, I agree with you that there's some kind of benefit, but there are inherent rights uh, within us, such as my own data that, that I just do not want to, that should not be shared with other people and, and so on. So, so do you, do you see that? Well, I, I mean, I have a number of friends yeah. that are ethicists and, and I, I, I teach a course in ethics and I've published, uh, you know, a couple dozen papers uh, on ethics, safety, uh, policy related things. Um, you know, I, I, first of all, I, I uh, was, I am concerned about any new technology or any new innovation, social innovation, like social networks or uh, sharing data. These are social innovations. Um, I think the important thing is to not coerce, and coercion goes beyond, you know, twisting somebody's arm or even offering them money. There are various ways you can set up a, a, a social norm Implicit, which, 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 yeah, which, where basically so many people are doing it, yeah. that's a, that's a form of coercion. So you have to be very careful about that. Uh, occasionally, there will be coercion that is good. So, for example, uh, coercion for public health measures. You know, uh, washing your hands it, uh, before you serve food. That's co there's coercion on that. There's uh, or taking vaccines to provide herd immunity. Uh, 
So a little coercion sometimes is the right thing, but you need to think about it very carefully what the unintended consequences are. Uh, I, can, I can think of negative scenarios where your genome could be used against you, but we should think about those neg So Some of my colleagues don't like it when scientists get criticized, say, in, in movies, you know, Frankenstein or uh, you know, Jurassic Park or something like that. But I think it's good. I think we need to... We need to have that scenario building, the negative scenario building, and think two or three or chess moves ahead uh, as to how to prevent that. Um, so uh, one of the things we did to prevent that it was the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act of 2008. It's not perfect, but it does uh, help send the message to health care providers, health insurers, and employers to not discriminate based on genetics alone. Now, they're still allowed to discriminate based on, you know, real problems, which may also be a problem. But in any case, it was a, a huge step in the right direction. And, it, and the only reason it took, one of the reasons it took 13 years to, uh, to pass as a bill was there were very few examples of genetic discrimination, and mostly involving um, well-paid athletes um, that they didn't want them dying on the basketball court of uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, for example, uh, or sickle cell. So um, where does that leave us? Uh, you know, I think we, we need to have a lot of discussion um, with, any, with all technologies and, so, and new social innovations. Um, it, it isn't always the case that the majority is correct. Uh, there, I mean, it, the majority, um, certainly, uh, and minority views re require respect and, and discussion, um, but we have to be careful not to have mob rule, um, however it goes, mob rule by scientists or by politicians or by capitalists, what, what have you. Um, uh, there's, no, there's not a simple answer, but I think the general trend is towards uh, sharing with know-how, with, with knowing what you're getting into, thoughtfully uh, deciding that you want to share, and in cases where you can retract it, the ability to retract it, but that's becoming increasingly difficult. The internet doesn't forget. Uh, anybody who's tried to erase, scrub their cell from the internet will find what's known as the Streisand effect, and I won't go into it, yeah, what it yeah. is because <laughs> it's, it's interfering with her personal... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, freedom, but it, it, it's when you try to cover something up, it becomes a big deal and goes viral. Yes. You mentioned something very interesting, which is that people are already kind of started to do this and it's almost, we're kind of on this inevitable train. More people will start sharing, the yeah. norms will change. And in the process, scientists and leaders will refine this to make people feel even more comfortable. But, but there, it does seem that technologies, when they emerge, there is some kind of sense of inevitability, that the technological innovations inevitably get us somewhere. And that's why people are techno optimists sometimes. They, they think technology has this tremendous power and inevitability to take us to somewhere better. No. Do, you, do you see that? Uh, uh, that, I, that? I'm not a big believer in inevitability. In particular, I'm not a believer in inevitability in the way that it's originally conceived of, right? So you might initially conceive of uh, you know, germline editing of babies in order to get blue eyes or something like that. And I just, I think it's unlikely that's uh, going to happen. It's unlikely that that's going to be the public health crisis. Uh, we already do a lot of cosmetic things. Um, the point is, uh, we, if we don't like cosmetic uh, hegemony, if we don't like uh, a certain, we should focus on the outcomes rather than on the methods. There's a tendency to confuse the two. It's like, oh, because we now have awesome power, but because we, we now have cars that can go 200 miles an hour, we're all going to go 200 miles an hour. We're, and that's just not, that's not true. Even, even with the places without speed limits, there, we don't go at the max, typically, most people don't go at the maximum that their car can handle. So the slippery, slippery slope argument uh, I don't buy. Uh, Interesting. Generally. Wow. Um, I think that we we know how to set 
either sharp lines where there are no sharp lines. We can, we can yeah. say 55, that's not negotiable. Yeah. Or we can make a sliding curve where you say, you know, the more you pollute, the more you have to pay to get it cleaned up. Uh, you know, there are various ways, both all or none and, or continuous that we, uh, but we need to recognize what, what it is we actually want rather getting it confused with all the thing, all the me means, all the mechanisms, because mechanisms can be used for both good and, and, and bad. I mean, you know, you know, the, jetliners the, can be run into buildings. That doesn't mean we should be <laughs> jetliners, right? This is a truly nuanced way to, of thinking about this, but, but I think, Professor Church, we should dive a little bit more into CRISPR because that's oh. what kind of gets people a little bit nervous, uh, the gene editing technology. And, and I, I took a class in high school, molecular biology, and I studied under this former Harvard postdoc. He was a Harvard postdoc and he went to teach biology at my school and, and he introduced all this new technology to us back then and it sounded fascinating. And would you mind telling us a little bit more about CRISPR-Cas9? Because you are really one of the pioneers in the field. Right, well, so the way I look at it, uh, CRISPR was something where uh, the public, and in fact, many scientists, suddenly woke up to what was already going on. It was kind of like a, an icon. It's like uh, the internet had been going on since the 60s. I mean, I used a, a network, you know, as a, you know, in ninth grade, um, uh, 1968. Um, but people didn't wake up until there was a World Wide Web. That was something you plastered on top of it uh, that suddenly got everybody's attention, but the internet was the, was the revolution and it was already here. Uh, same thing with CRISPR is we already had a gene editing revolution. In fact, two people got uh, a Nobel Prize for it uh, back Last in the year. 80s. Uh, or, or, oh, back in the 80s, yes. Yeah, for um, uh, Mario Capecci and Oliver Smithies. Um, and their method was very effective. It was used to edit thousands of mice, for example. They each had uh, their own little uh, mutation that was put in very precisely. That was precise editing as well. Now, CRISPR came along and, and everybody did catch up. They said, oh yeah, wow, that's really cool. They, they had never heard of, uh, of transgenic mice or edited, you know, I guess, what do we call them? Uh, genetically engineered mice, it was called, not edited mice. Uh, and, uh, and gene therapy had been uh, alive and well. And gene therapy was just coming back from a setback uh, where it had had some, you know, toxic effects and no drug category goes forward uh, without, uh, you know, low harm. Um, and so gene therapy happened to be swinging upward and CRISPR kind of became the symbol for gene therapy as well, for gene editing, uh, you know, in plants, animals, and, uh, and humans. But, it, but it, in, act, in fact, uh, CRISPR was not as good as some of these previous methods, like uh, gene therapy, you typically would add a gene that's missing. Most people that, that have a serious medical condition due to their inherited genetics um, are missing a gene. Uh, that their, their mother and their father had half a dose, and, and then one quarter of their kids are missing the gene completely and are very sick. Um, and so what you want is something that adds genes, but CRISPR is good at subtracting them. Uh, which is a rare, uh, which is a less commonly needed um, uh, thing. Nevertheless, CRISPR was uh, easier to use, a little bit cheaper to use, but it's not like the 10 million fold that we were talking about earlier with sequencing. That 10 million fold, that was game changing. And yeah, CRISPR was like fourfold, um, maybe, maybe in the best case scenario, tenfold. Um, it was, uh, but nevertheless, still a revolution. Um, and, and there will be more, just like there have been multiple different ways of doing DNA sequencing, most of which I've uh, tried or, or contributed to, uh, there, will be mul there have been and will be multiple editing. And there's already new ones coming out um, that are back to precise editing again, and adding, subtracting, and, and epigenetic editing where you, where you change how it's regulated. Yeah. Um yeah. Could you tell us, I guess, a little bit more about the ongoing revolution, I guess, we're seeing because a lot of people are also talking about big data, because with big data, we can find a specific DNA bit that correlates with a resistance with to certain diseases and, and these specific bits 
are, I, I think, are called SMPs. And right. you and your former postdoc uh, student, Feng Zhang, uh, have really adapted CRISPR Cas9 to in vivo editing. And you open a doorway for us to precisely change these bits. Uh, right. that are, that are, and so, so is my understanding largely correct? Um, yes. Uh, well, it certainly is aligned with the, the party line. Uh, the, the thing is, I, I just want to balance it a little bit, not overbalance, but, but to say uh, these genetic mutations, I've already said these genetic mutations, most of them can be fixed by adding a gene. So for that, you don't need editing, or, or, or you wouldn't call it editing. Uh, it's adding a gene that's missing. Uh, and that's conventional gene therapy. It's sometimes called transgenics. Um, that's number one. Number two is there's an alternative. Uh, gene therapy is now the most expensive uh, uh, therapy in history. It's about a million dollars a dose. Um, and I'm not, just like I wasn't happy with the $3 billion price tag for the first genome, I'm not happy with the million dollar price tag for gene therapies. And these are, whether they're CRISPR or not, they're still about the same price, and I'm, uh, I think there's room for improvement. One thing that is not frequently enough uh, addressed when they're talking about reducing its cost is there is an alternative to gene therapy for the next generation, which is genetic counseling. Genetic counseling, uh, I think, is sometimes miscategorized as well, first of all, people don't even think about it at all. They say, oh, we'll just handle it with gene therapy. We'll wait until it's a million dollar problem and we'll solve it with high tech. Uh, there's a tendency, especially in America, to solve problems with high technology rather than low technology. Um, we, you know, uh, let's have a multi-billion dollar vaccine rather than putting on masks. Heaven forbid that we should put on a mask uh, because you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm wearing all this other stuff but I can't wear something here. Yeah, you know? it's like it's my my right. You know, it's it's you know it's yeah. uh, to to not wear anyway. Uh, so we <laughs> go for the high tech rather than low tech, um, and gene, gene therapy is an example of that. But the, but the genetic counseling rather than being a million dollars is more like a hundred dollars, uh, and it can happen. It's uh, not ideal uh, for some people to have genetic counseling tell them that. You know, they married somebody who has, uh, a, a, you know, something that will cause that, that together that pair is a bad pair uh, in terms of medically producing. I mean, they may, might be a great pair socially, but in ter genetically they're, they're going to uh, have um, to deal with uh, offspring that are uh, severely medically uh, damaged, uh, which can affect the, the, the whole family in terms of. Uh, outlook and psychology and so forth. Um, in vitro fertilization is not for everybody. It involves hormone treatments. It's, it's a way of, of dealing with that incompa genetic incompatibility between a pair, um, but it involves hormone treatments. It involves some, it very often multiple rounds are needed. It might take, uh, you know, tens of thousands of dollars per round, and it might take you six rounds. And, and, and then still not have a child. Um, uh, you can do in vitro fertilization where you're checking the genetics of the, of the fertilized eggs, basically. Um, but if you go far enough back to before, before you're married, while you're still thinking about marriage, then there's really, it's much less uh, invasive, much less harmful to the psychology uh, of everybody involved. Uh, financially, it's, it's cheaper as well. Uh, so, so I think that's something that's not often talked about, is that you can, you can do genetic counseling and you can do it very early on. And this is, a limit, this is effective too, this is not speculative. The Doria Shareem and other um, genetic counseling has completely eliminated, almost completely eliminated uh, a number of genetic diseases, very serious ones like Tay-Sachs disease, uh, by doing genetic counseling. So, uh, um, those are the those are the two comments. One is it's adding genes, not just editing yes. them. And second is that you can do it without any gene therapy at all via genetic counseling. Uh, Professor Church, there's a lot to unpack there. I mean, you, you uh, not, not only. Uh, mentioned this part of uh, 
early pre-marriage counseling, but but also the, the fact that uh, CRISPR Cas9 allows us to not only delete certain info, but also precisely add in new sequences in, in specific uh, locations. And and I just want to touch on that a little bit more, the technical part, the, the difference between CRISPR Cas9 and gene therapy, gene drive, all these previous kinds of uh, gene therapeutic uh, usages that, that you've been working on for, for your whole life. So uh, when is the turning point that, that people saw this coming? And also, uh, what are some of the broader differences that other differences that you, you would like to characterize for us? Well, so gene therapy really started taking off around uh, Y2K, year 2000. Um, but it also started failing in that year uh, because there were three deaths. There was one death in two different studies, so one death in one study due to um, an immune reaction to the vector, and in the, two deaths in another study due to the, the way it was delivered causing cancer. Um, since then, we've developed better vectors that don't have the immune res uh, response and don't, don't cause cancer at any appreciable frequency. So it's now safe to deliver whatever gene you're missing. You don't need CRISPR. I want to emphasize that you just deliver the gene uh, via, let's say, an AAV vector, an adeno-associated virus capsid. So it's not the virus, it's just the protein coat. You put the gene that's missing in there, you deliver it to the appropriate tissue, and uh, in many cases that's effective. Um, it's especially effective if the product of that uh, payload, that gene, it diffuses or is spread throughout the body or spread locally. So, so you don't have to get it to every cell, you just get it to a few cells and then they act as factories that work for the rest of your life. And this has an advantage over other therapies and it's kind of once in your lifetime sort of thing, once and done. Uh, it still is a million dollars and we need to bring that price down. Um, or, as much as possible, uh, reduce the need for it uh, by genetic counseling. So some combination of bringing the price of, of the therapies down and bringing the number of therapies that you need to do down. And then the product of those two, uh, it will be better for the healthcare system. Another thing I wanted to ask you about, Professor Church, is this idea of off-target effect. Yeah. So, so one of the main concerns about CRISPR, despite all the vastly improved accuracy compared to previous genetic technology, is this idea of off-target effects. Could you explain a little bit to us and the, the kind of hurdles that we still need to overcome on well, that first front? First of all, it's not clear that CRISPR is more accurate than previous methods. I mean, uh, for example, putting in a gene that's missing, that's usually pretty accurate. Uh, even editing uh, what, what, what for the, you know, the Smithies and Capecci editing was quite accurate, uh, more accurate than CRISPR. CRISPR makes both on-target and off-target errors. So anyway, I just want to put that out there. Um, uh, again, I, I've enjoyed, I've benefited tremendously from the attention that CRISPR has gotten, um, but I just think it's, it's my responsibility as a beneficiary to, to explain uh, in a, a well-rounded way. Um, but off-target, I think, even though CRISPR may not be better at off-target, uh, it is so good that it's, not, it's barely worth thinking about. Uh, in our very first paper um, on CRISPR, we did discuss it, we were the only ones talking about off-target for CRISPR, and we wrote a program that would check the whole genome. So it, there's a tendency to focus on the target, right? But uh, then our program looked at the, at the genome for what, what might be close by. But you also have to do it empirically. It's not just a theoretical computer exercise. You have to test because there are surprises where it doesn't do exactly what the computer would predict. But the computer is a good free screen. Uh, but it's so low, it's kind of a, uh, the, the well-designed ones, the well-tested ones, the ones that make it through, uh, are lower than the spontaneous mutation rate. And again, not everybody is aware, uh, or maybe they know it, but they don't think about it every day, is that you're being bombarded by uh, chemicals and radiation all day. Uh, and you're getting lots of mutations, um, and so is your germline, your, your future children. Um, when you take cancer chemotherapy, that's something where you intention, you know, the physician intentionally is giving something that's known uh, mutagen in many cases. Uh, so anyway, it's well below 
that spontaneous level that um, in, in the cases that have been where you've gone through the process of refinement of the on-target and off-target efficiencies. Uh, one slightly philosophical question, uh, I guess also touching on our previous discussion when, when you were talking about Silicon Valley and social innovations, is, is um, this idea that a lot of times people feel uncomfortable uh, accepting uh, CRISPR-Cas9 or, or gene editing or gene therapy in general is because they feel like part of what's core of being a human, there's, there's kind of physical editing uh, of their nature. Even though socially we're very malleable, uh, our, our society looks vastly different from uh, what we will be in, in, in 100 years and what we were even 10 years ago. And um, there are all kinds of other evolutionary um, uh, processes that happen. But could you help us pinpoint that tension a little bit more and, and why you think somehow, is this fear irrational or, or it could, could it be resolved that, that people are much more open uh, to, to this idea of, of accepting gene therapy, gene editing for, for their children for later generations? Uh, in order to achieve some kind of social welfare uh, improvement? For example, having fewer children die, fewer uh, diseases? I don't think it's irrational. I think it's uh, quite rational to be uh, fearful of new technologies. I encourage that, not, I don't try to sugarcoat it. Um, in fact, I think many people who re represent themselves as rationalists uh, are rationalizing their own uh, affiliations, uh, their own addictions um, to the future. Um, that said, uh, I think that we need, again, to focus on the outcomes rather than on the methods. Uh, so we uh, change ourselves and our next generation without the next generation's approval, um, because they're infants. Um, and we do it in ways that are heritable, that, that, that year after year, uh, sorry, generation after generation, it is transmitted um, without much uh, modification in a, in, a, in a kind of evolutionary pattern with slow changes. So for example, our educational system, most of our religions, most of the way we dress, our customs, our foods, those are surely inherited from generation to generation and we can change them a single family can make a dramatic shift. Um, sometimes in the process of a migration, they'll just decide to change their customs. And then that sticks, again, for generations. Um, so, uh, you know, this thing is, is a new artifact that is highly heritable. Um, you know, my daughter has one just like this, and her daughters will, uh, you know, are already in transition to that. And to, to say that genetics is less reversible, for example, is I think naive. I mean, you can, if you can go one way, you can go the other. Um, I think the cell phone is, is quite irreversible. Try to pry this loose from anybody, yes. you know, try to, a politician that banned cell phones yes. would not last long. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, so really, uh, we should focus on the things like equitable distribution, right? Smallpox is, a, is an example of equitable distribution. One of the few technologies that really has been distributed, you know, clean water, roads, cheap electronics, almost there, but not really fully equitably distributed to everybody. But smallpox, because it's extinct, nobody has to pay a penny to maintain that, that uh, public health positive. Um, we need to that's part of the ethical uh, dilemma, is making sure that everybody gets access and that they're well informed, that they know that they want access. Just because they have access doesn't mean they necessarily uh, want it. Um, you know, many of these things are individual specific, but they impact other families when our children meet their children, you know? So the fact that we made our decision can also affect the other family um, because of the, the constant mixing, which is uh, quite healthy. Uh, so anyway, we have, again, just like the talk, things we talked about before, we have to have lots of discussions, but the discussions don't necessarily mean that we're gonna take a vote at the end, because uh, the majority is not always correct, um, and it needs to respect the minority. 
just having the 51% um, make the 49% miserable is not, uh, is not what we're aiming for. Professor Church, I guess a, a big concern I personally have is that it's very hard to get these nuanced ideas, like what you just said, out to the public in today's media landscape. I, I still remember in the end of 2019, uh, 60 Minutes aired uh, one of the interviews and interactions with you uh, and your comments on uh, the dating app <laughs> that, that you were you were working on. It caused a lot of controversy. What, the idea is to use DNA comparisons to make sure people who share a genetic mutation um, like, like cystic fibrosis, you know, not, not fall in love. And and it, they only aired it for like one minute or two. And it caused the Twitter storm and everybody was outraged. And, and but but the thing is, that idea was much more nuanced and, and you had so much more to say about these topics. But today's media land, landscape, whether it's social media or legacy media, it seems that they have to reduce all the brilliant ideas into two minute clickbaits or, or, or sound bites. So that it's very hard, it seems, for scientists like you, nuanced thinkers to actually convince to the public, this is our thinking, we're struggling through this and we're, this, we're reasoning through this, listen to us. So are you optimistic about how the public will gradually change their perceptions to some of those technologies, especially in this age of uh, misinformation uh, and, and, and so on? Well, I, I mean, I think in defense of 60 minutes, well, first of all, it's not 60 minutes, <laughs> it's more like 15. Yeah. Uh, of, of, which, of which one minute was on this subject, which I think neither they nor I were, were uh, properly prepared for. Uh, <laughs> yes. You know, I think people, I think I believe in the, the, the population does have, uh, is a lot smarter than people say uh, sometimes. Uh, but smart people can do dumb things and, uh, and part of, or, or can, they can do something that the rest of the population doesn't respect. It doesn't mean that it's dumb. Um, and it's because they're playing a different game. You know, it's, it's some kind of game theory is going on and you don't respect their game or they're playing your game not by your rules or, you know, et cetera. They're trying to maximize their benefit and they can uh, rationalize it, um, why they're doing what they're doing. To them, the, the, the risk of uh, COVID is lower than the risk of, um, you know, having trouble with your mask or having, uh, not being able to see what people are saying. Uh, and it's hard to calculate these things genuinely. I, I feel very strongly on the math side, but I can't really prove it. I wouldn't, uh, I can only prove it on, on, on a few axes. I can prove it on a public health axis, but not on every axis. Uh, and I think that's what happens is people just assume that everybody has the same motivations as the majority have. Um, uh, so that's, that's one thing. I, the nuances, they become, less nuanced when it really matters, you know? So let's say the theory of evolution doesn't really matter to most people. It doesn't, it doesn't affect your life, whether dinosaurs were 6,000 years ago or 60 million years ago. It, it really doesn't help you pay your bills or, to, you know, train your children to be good <laughs> moral citizens. Yeah. Um, and so that's why that's controversial. Uh, I think it was Churchill or some statesman that said that the reason that you know, academic fights are so intense is because so little is at stake. Uh, we need to choose our conversations very carefully. And to some extent, germline editing is, is another example. There's really almost no use case for it. There's almost no clinical justification. And so it's much ado about nothing. It's a tempest in a teapot. Uh, uh, a very intense tempest, but you, you, it's hard to get somebody to describe. Even even the case where somebody went to prison in China, where you know three young uh, uh, ch children uh, were edited, uh, relative to other new therapies, it wasn't that much of a tempest. I mean, there are all three of them are still alive, as far as we know, healthy, as far as we know, right? Which was not the case, um, you know, for the initial trials of monoclonal antibodies, the initial trials of gene therapy, and so forth. Um, but it's also a, a tempest teapot in that what he did wasn't useful, particularly. I mean, it's not, it is true that HIV kills 2 million people a year, but his solution doesn't strike one as, as the right solution because 
even drugs, which are much, even anti-HIV drugs, which are very, fairly effective, uh, you know, Magic Johnson is still alive two decades later, uh, <laughs> are relatively cheap compared to yeah. gene therapy. Um, but, they're, but they're not cheap enough to handle the two, most of the two million people are extremely poor. So the problem is we need solutions, and we have solutions that, ha that involve social uh, change, but that doesn't work. It's hard to, we need better education, we need better, better um, anti-poverty measures um, so that they can get the education they need to do things like have safe sex. That's probably the cheapest of the three methods, gene therapy, antiretroviral therapies, and um, public health safe sex. Yes. I see. Uh, Professor Georgia, we, we don't have too much time left. Uh, I know you have to leave in five minutes. Uh, in, the, in the tradition of our show, I'll just ask you one last question, uh, which is, uh, what would be your punchline? Because the name of our show is Policy Punchline. I always ask at the end of our show, uh, what would your punchline be about anything uh, that we've talked about today? Well, I'll, I'll include policy since that's in your name. Sure. Uh, <laughs> um, so I think that, uh, I, I, I think there's a tendency for my colleagues, both uh, scientists and non-scientists, to, th to actually think in terms of policy, like they should, they should lobby. And that's all good. Voting, lobbying, very good. Uh, you know, talk, communication with your Congress. Uh, you, you, you asked just a little bit back uh, what, um, you know, how do we deal with the misinformation? One of the ways of dealing with this is through uh, uh, communication through uh, media that people listen to, which is uh, movies and television. So we, so I, I've joined my wife who runs a, a operation called PG Ed for Personal Genetics Education, where she edu we educate the um, uh, screenwriters and write and other writers and congressmen, Congress people that that because they go back to their to their respective districts. And they have conversations, so that's a way of, by one conversation can affect, you know, 500 or more, um, and one conversation with a screenwriter can affect 20 million viewers. So that's a way, and 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 it's in a form that people will accept. Rati writing long dissertations isn't necessarily consumed by all the Joe six packs in the world. Um, so th those are some of the, the methods. And another way to affect policy is to come up with good technologies. So uh, things that have very few downsides. Uh, it's all about the positives versus the negatives. Uh, you know, when this thing came out, people were worried it was going to fry your brain or it was going to addict your face to, you know, so you wouldn't make any social content. And some of those are right and some of those are probably wrong. Um, but make good technology. You know, you don't need to pass a law to get everybody one of these things. Uh, you don't need to have uh, medical provider, insurance providers to uh, compensate you to, uh, to pay for your cell phone. You're going to go out and pay for it yourself. And if we went out and paid for a lot of our medical care, um, we'd be better consumers, probably. Uh, so, so I think that you can either try to change the law or you can try to make something that is that sells itself essentially uh, people will think about it because they're excited about it um, they'll talk about it because they're excited about it you don't have to ram some academic uh, concept down your throat they're genuinely it affects their life in a positive way and they will take care of the policy by, by various means Professor Church, thank you so much for joining me today. I, I, as I told you, uh, to prepare for this interview, uh, we drafted it around like 55 questions, and, and, and we probably got through a, a third of them. So, so uh, it's I just. I you were going to say we got through 75. <laughs> <laughs> I would have uh, really loved to to ask you a little bit more. Uh, other wild philosophical questions, ethical questions, and also uh, synthetic biology, some of your other thoughts on the healthcare sector, private sector, your private sector experience okay. and innovations, but uh, but we don't have enough time this time. But well, so, so perhaps people, another people opportunity. people like this one, they'll let you know and we'll think about uh, <laughs> yes. a sequel. Okay. A sequel. Uh, Professor Church, thank you so much for joining me. I hope you're, you're doing well with your family and, and everything's staying safe. Yeah, everything's fine. Th thank you, Tiger. Uh, stay well. Awesome. 
of course. See you soon. <laughs>、well, and this concludes this episode、uh, with Professor George Church. He is the Robert Winthrop Professor of Genetics at my Harvard Medical School and Professor of Health Sciences and Technology at Harvard MIT. He is known as the father of synthetic biology and CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing technology, and widely recognized as one of the most important geneticists of our age. Thank you so much for listening today, as Professor Church、uh, alluded to at the very end. Hopefully, we can get some good feedback for this episode and、uh, do a sequel.、Uh, we have a lot of other questions prepared、uh, about <laughs> the future of biotech and, and science innovations.、Uh, thank you so much for listening. You may follow us on policypunchline.com, watch the video、uh, on YouTube, or listen on iTunes, Spotify, any of your selecting、uh, your your preferred. Podcasting platform.、Uh, you may read our newsletter at tigergal.substack.com, which is, has been launched launched for a while.、Um, thank you so much for following Policy Punch Line. We'll see you next time. You've been listening to Policy Punch Line, a podcast generously supported by the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance at Princeton University. We would also like to encourage you to follow other podcasts produced by Princeton University, such as Politics and Polls by the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. Policy Punch Line is intended to be informational only and does not reflect nor represent the views of Princeton University or the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance. For more information on subscription, donation, volunteering, or contact, please visit policypunchline.com. Thank you again for listening.